In the 1860s across the state of Victoria, the first Australians are just holding on. The whites have been here for 30 years and now number half a million people. Over the same time, the first Australians have been reduced from 60,000 people to just 2,000. The whites believe the first Australians are on their way to extinction. Wonga is determined they will survive. He has just inherited leadership of his people and plans to take the newcomers on. He adopts whitefella clothes and adds the word Simon to his name. His cousin Barak is equally resolute they will live. His overwhelming love for his people sustains him through their campaign. This is the story of Wonga and Barak's lifetime struggle and how their people overcame the authorities who tried to wipe them from the face of the earth. In 1859, Simon Wonga leads a handful of men into Melbourne, which, fueled by gold, has become the most expensive city in the world. This is the heartland of white power. Only 30 years earlier, Wonga knew this place as the fertile bush of his childhood, the territory of his ancestors. The psyche of the people was being affected by the disappointment and sorrow of these people who lost everything, lost the land that their fathers had told them to look after and couldn't, and in their terms, couldn't be man enough to keep it. The place gets settled with extraordinary speed and there's just nowhere for people to go, for Aboriginal people to hide. There's no water that they can get to, there's no place that they can hunt kangaroo, there's no place that they can establish the way of life that they had developed over so many years. Wonga arrives at the newly completed and grandly ambitious Victorian Parliament House. Wonga's vision for his people is a compromise to gain a portion. Um, his father and his uncles start talking about portions of land. Um, they're not talking about getting their nation back. They're talking about a portion of land where we can live in peace and uh, uh, look after ourselves and our old people and our sick. Before the arrival of the newcomers, Victoria was a patchwork of 36 clans, each with their own language and territory, and was the most populated region in Australia. Wonga is the leader of the Wurundjeri clan, a role which is inherited, but must still be earned by showing compassion and diplomatic ability. He is known as the Norangita. They were the clan head. So uh, they were in effect, you know, chairman of the board. My Manata, my friend. I bring my friends. They want a block of land in their country where they may sit down, plant corn, potatoes, and work like white men. Wanga. Aboriginal people were enthusiastic about being successful, accommodating the necessary changes. This is the new world, they said. This is how we're going to do it. The new world has witnessed the abolition of slavery in the British Empire. And following the fashion, the Victorian government convenes a board of men to address the plight of the first Australians. It is known as the Protection Board. There's a sense of, of obligation to care for their well-being. Now, this is always very paternalistic. Wonga puts his trust in the board and meets with them to request land for the Wurundjeri. There were some good people on the protection board. There were some people who could look into the future um, and had generosity in their hearts. 
and those people were urging for a grant of land to be made to the Wurundjeri people. The border protection, I believe, and it was, would be just a dream, but um, which should have been made up of um, leaders of the Aboriginal community together with white people. It's not a kindly, charitable, evangelistic act that's embodied in this idea of protection. It's the idea that, well, the natives are going to die out anyway. And so to make it more convenient for them and more convenient for us, let's segregate them from our colonial outposts so that we can just get on with it and let them die peacefully over there. Charles Darwin's ideas of natural selection justify the authorities' views that the first Australians are destined to die out. Christian missionaries hope to save them and arrive from around the world and walk through the bush seeking out potential converts. Simon Wonga meets a Scottish preacher who visits Wonga's clan every Sunday to preach to them. They form a genuine friendship and the idea of getting land becomes a common vision between John Green, his wife Mary, and Simon Wonga. John Green was known to be a very devout Christian, but a very gentle man and a very understanding man. Green was a freak. He had almost no prejudices. And whether you're black, white or whatever, uh, there are a few people around like Green. There was this ideology that Indigenous people were inferior and incapable of developing farming and things like that. So uh, John Green probably transcended that mindset and that he had full faith in the community, their capabilities and what they were able to, to achieve. Wonga and Green's plan is to gather up the children and give them an education that equips them for this new world. John's wife, Mary Green, begins teaching literacy to her kids alongside the Wurundjeri kids in the bush. They wait for a year for word of their land. Wonga's faith in the board is wavering. In 1863, Wonga leads his people and John Green back to their country. The number of people in that photo was about 10 to 15 or something, and that was pretty much uh, the number of people that had survived the devastation from a particular area. They arrive at their chosen place on the banks of the Yarra River. And without the approval of the Protection Board, he makes the radical decision to claim the land as their own. My great-great-uncle Barak said, there's no mountains for me on the Murray. Leave me here on this place at the Yarra, my place. They call the site Corandirk, after a tree that blossoms along the river. This is just ironic, wasn't it? Because this is in fact what the settlers has done 25 years earlier, just taken land and here they were taking things into their own hand and so they formed this settlement at a place of their choice. And they were all young men and I think idealists. They were all men that developed a vision together, a vision that Aboriginal people could have land of their own in this sea of European control. The news of this independent community spreads and the headmen of neighbouring clans bring their people to Corandirk. The Wadharong, Kurong, Jajarong, Tangarong and Bunwarong are now gathered at Corandirk. It is an alliance of the clans and Wonga is their undisputed leader as they are on his turf. Since we began to settle and live in our own houses, we have improved much. We are now happy to see so many children about us. 
Some are coming home. They are now tired of the bush. It is better to live here than to go about and drink. Wonga. It would be a refuge for them, a place where they could grow up families and they could learn to work the land in new ways and show that they could do so and be flexible. And they even said that in their words, that they would show the white people that they could work like white people and make it a success. Black fella now throw away all war spears. No more fighting, but live like white men, almost. Wonga. It is now four months since we arrived, and not one of them has left the station. They have nearly finished nine bark huts. They have also made many rugs, which has enabled them to buy boots, hats, coats. And some of them have even bought horses. John Green, Kurundayuk Station. Wonga and Barak, who have made homes for themselves at Korundurk, are very intelligent men and in their behavior would compare favorably with the better class of other races. Robert Brow Smythe, Secretary, Protection Board. The board supports Wonga's initiative in establishing Corandirk, but insists on keeping hold of the purse strings and controlling their activities. By 1865, other clans and missionaries have requested land from the board, and there are now five other reserves across the region in the west, Framlingham and Lake Conda, in the north, Ebenezer and Kumragunja, and in the south, Lake Tyres and Romiak. The first Australians now reside on less than 1% of their original land. If they have let people just roam around the countryside or, or you know, not set up as many reserves as they did and not attempted to just, you know, piecemeal keep them alive, but there might be nothing they might be done of us here now, because we would all just got killed off. The reserves offer a haven from the outside world, but to live on the reserves, the first Australians must convert to Christianity. The reserves that we, we were on were really set up as the soothing pillow for a dying race. What they hadn't bargained on that we would continue to survive. The entire population that now knows itself to be Aboriginal in Victoria is descended from just that 300 and so people who were put on the reserves. The mission Romiak on Gunai land is run by a German missionary, Brother Hagenauer. It prospers through his iron will. He bans all forms of Aboriginal religious ceremony, preferring European rituals and incantations, and preferring them in daylight, in suits, in English and indoors. The corroboree is carried out in the forest by moonlight, with shocking gestures in satanical excitement, and is a real festival of the enemy of the soul, the German Moravians created a total institution and attempted to convert the Aboriginal uh, residents, not just to Christianity itself, but also to a European way of life. It's a double-edged sword because we lost so much. The churches convert our people to Christianity, which denied our lot the opportunity to carry on with our spirituality and our self-beings, and that's something that affects me pretty deeply. With Corandirk's church not yet built, John Green preaches to the people under the trees. Green convinces Barak to stop using his traditional powers of sorcery and Barak becomes his first convert. The residents also unanimously agree that men must now have only one wife 
and Barak marries Annie in a Christian ceremony. My method of managing the blacks is to allow them to rule themselves as much as possible. When there is any strafe among them, this is always settled in a kind of court at which I preside, John Green. His idea was that Aboriginal people were more than capable of governing themselves, so he would let them do it. Unlike other reserves, a council that includes all adults governs Corrandirk. And people were happy there. Not even the angel Gabriel could manage Kolonderk. We are afraid of them on the other stations. The natives read the newspapers and say, the Corrandirk people get this and that allowed. We want that too. The uniqueness of Corrandirk was still maintaining community and family and maintaining connection to their landscape. And it's a beautiful place. By 1872, Corrandirk is prosperous. Their houses are impressive. They dress with elegance and the women sell their baskets and eggs for fashion books and dresses. If those people had been allowed to continue that success and to bring their children up with that feeling of success, we would have grown more great statesmen and stateswomen in those, in those communities. And if white people had wanted to negotiate with those people, it would have changed the way history went in Victoria. In 1872, the board invests in a new venture at Corrandirk to create a lucrative industry of harvesting hops to make beer. The residents throw themselves into this venture they build kilns and fill their fields with a hops plantation. The board has promised Green and the Corrandirk residents that the profits will fund a new hospital. It was a triumph, but it was an optimistic triumph because of, in the end, that rug was whipped out from under their feet like a magician's trick. The board employs a white overseer who takes control from Wonga and Green. He brings in white labour and then pays wages only to the white workers. The board is under no obligation to pay wages to the Aborigines. They must be attentive and civil to all persons, otherwise they will be sent away. Robert Brow Smythe. The protection board sells the entire hops plantation and the government keeps the profit, equivalent to a million dollars today. The promise to build a hospital is broken. Corrandirk has fallen into disrepair with the overwhelming demands of the hops plantation. The conflict over wages is escalating and the protection board comes to Corrandirk to interrogate Green. Well, gentlemen, I must confess that there is much now not done that I would have liked to get done, and striving to get the hop garden in good order. I have had to neglect things I would have otherwise have done. I think Green uh, suffered when his promises to Aboriginal people were broken by the white administration. It really hurt him that he had to go back and say to the Wurundjeri, that promise I gave you, that's been broken again. 
And seeing there is an inclination in some of the members of the board to think that I have not been doing right, I wish you would relieve me of Coran Dirk and put someone else here. John Green. Mr. Green spoke to me a long time ago. He told me not to go walk about anymore. I kept his word. Bonga. A few days later, Green withdraws his resignation, devastated by his momentary loss of loyalty to Simon Wonga. But it is too late. The board takes the opportunity to get rid of him and bans him from entering Corandirk. The demise of John Green would have been due to his style of leadership, and that is he was encouraging people to be self-determining, make their own decisions. John Green refuses to leave them. He buys a property next door, and every Sunday, the Corandirk residents make their way to him to receive his service. For all of Green's goodness, uh, it, it doesn't mean that it was ever going to work because he had no friends. His friends were black and he wasn't going to succeed unless he could convince other people to go along that journey with him. The, you know, the people who had hold of the gears of government, they were the people you had to change. The Corridor residents plead for Green to be reinstated but the protection board refuses. Wonga and the residents decide to go on strike, but the board simply ignores them. With his people's future uncertain, Wonga dies of tuberculosis. Some say of a broken heart. It always uh, grieves me to think how those truly intelligent people must have died. What was going on in their, in their mind when they died, it's heartbreaking. Without a senior son to inherit the role, Wonga's cousin, Barak, becomes the Wurundjeri Nariangata. I am Wurundjeri from my father. We want a man whom God chose to lay the foundations of Corandirk Station, and that's Mr. Green. On July the 7th, 1875, Barak leads a delegation of Corandirk residents to Melbourne, seeking Green's reinstatement. They make the 60 kilometre journey on foot to engage directly with those in power. For if it wasn't for him, we're all dead. And that's all we require just now. And may the Lord bless you, sir, and give you good knowledge. I remain your kind friend, William Berwick. If we can get a sense of Barak from words on a page, then it is that he's uh, aristocratic in his bearing, he's highly intelligent, and he must have been charming in many ways because he persuaded so many people. And he had such loyal supporters. Having arrived in Melbourne after a long journey, Barak is told the protection board will not see him. With little other option, he and his people walk back to Corandirk. With all his intelligence, with all his negotiating skills, with all his seer-like qualities, uh, was still treated like a hapless child. Nothing is heard from the protection board, so Barak writes directly to the minister. He's in many ways, I think, superior to the white colonials that he was dealing with who were offended by his subversion and the intelligence of his subversion. 
The board, of course, is outraged that they have gone above their heads, and they decide to do away with Corandirk, to sell the land and remove them all. Robert Wanden, Johnny Webster. So begins a two-year campaign of petitions, strikes, deputations and lobbying with politicians and the press. Thomas Donnelly. I, William Barrack, member of Coroner. Willie Barker. Martin Simpson. Johnny Phillips. I will name the names of those who are willing to live and die here. Johnny Charles. Thomas Avoca. Jeremy Barker. It seems we are all going to be treated like slaves, far as we heard of it. Finally, with the matter in full public view, there is a hotly contested debate in Parliament, and a Royal Commission of Inquiry is called into Corandirk. The board is mortified. The Commission is to inquire into the present condition of the Aborigines of this colony and to advise as to the best means of caring for and dealing with them in the future. The Royal Commission recommends Corandirk be maintained and improved. The Protection Board, stung by criticism that it is openly doing the opposite, now does the opposite more covertly. Their agenda is still to destroy Corandirk. Barak now turns to an unlikely but staunch ally in Anne Bon, one of the richest landowners in the district. She is a fiery Scot and well connected with the highest society. Barak's house was the council chambers in which the elders met to discuss their affairs, which were connected chiefly with what they considered the injustice shown them by the Aborigines board. Anne Bon. That friendship is terribly important to her. And I think it's important to realise that uh, it's not just fulfilling a promise, it's also a friendship that comes out of it, that lasts throughout both their lives. By March 1881, the board's plans for the closure of Corandirk seem certain. Anne Bond writes an impassioned letter to the Premier of Victoria. The blacks are neither slaves nor criminals. Then why are they treated as such? You have the power to reappoint the manager they love, to whom they always repair when invaded by sickness and death. And by doing so, you will have the assistance of the house, the thanks of the outside public, and the approval of heaven. Anne Bonn. On the 28th of March, 1881, 22 Corandirk men walk to Melbourne again. Barak has broken his leg, and it has healed badly, but he insists on leading the men whilst in great pain. They arrive at Anne Bond's house in Melbourne, unannounced. Barak and the other 21 men from Corandirk sleep on her veranda that evening scandalizing the local reverend. Anne Bond couldn't care less, and in the morning she introduces them to no less than the Premier of Victoria, Mr. Berry. They raise the stakes even higher. This time they ask the Premier to do away with the protection board. We want the board to be no longer over us. Then we will show the country that the station could support itself. Mr. Berry then saw the black fellows one by one and questioned them privately as to the state of affairs at the station. They all agreed in asking for the appointment of Mr. Green and in complaining that the present manager exercised no control over them, the Argus. Berry is moved by the deputation and he establishes yet another inquiry into the conditions and management of Corandirk. After the long journey home, Barak returns to find his wife Annie is desperately ill. John Green, defying the ban on him visiting Corandirk, prays at her deathbed. A few
few days later, she passes away. While Barak is in mourning for his wife, his son David also deteriorates. A member of the board promises to meet Barak in Melbourne and arrange for his boy's admission to hospital. Barak and his son wait as the night falls. When I went to Melbourne, no one was there to meet us. We did not know where to go and it was dark and cool and late at night. I told my boy that we would go to Kew to Mrs. Bond. I had to carry my boy to Mrs. Bond. And it was late in the night and we had supper there. Berra. The next day, Anne Bond takes Barack and his son to hospital. Barack is not allowed to stay with his son. He was exceedingly distressed at being left alone by his father. He was in the greatest distress at being left in the hospital. Doctor. David dies alone in hospital. He is 14 years old. In his grief, Barak returns to Corandirk to seek comfort from his friend, Thomas Banfield. When I got home from taking my poor fella to the hospital, Tommy and I were crying about him all evening. Then Tommy went to sleep and when he woke he said, I saw the poor fella. He was here. He said, I'm only waiting here for you and my father. Barak. I can only imagine how Barak felt that losing his son, who he, I believe, would have wanted to be the Narangita, the next Narangita, and a, a son that he would be able to walk with and teach him not only Aboriginal culture, but teach him how to be a part of the new world. Just looking at the, the pictures of him before and after, it, it obviously did affect him. He didn't seem as strong, as vital, as full. You can see that there's something missing in his eyes. Or, you know, his eyes were tinged with a heavy sadness. But there is little time for grieving. The first days of Premier Berry's inquiry are fast approaching. The members of the inquiry travel to Corandirk to hear the evidence of the residents. Almost every adult testifies, signs petitions or sends letters. If they had everything right and the government leave us here, give us this ground and let us manage here and get all the money. Why do not let the people do it themselves, do what they like, and go on and do the work? We don't want any board over us, only one man, and that man is Mr. Green, and then we will show the country that we can work it and make it pay, and I know we will. Berk. The Age newspaper is the first to announce the recommendations of the inquiry. It opposes the abandonment of Corandirk and recommends a more sensitive management style. The Corandirk residents celebrate their victory. Mrs Deans was flourishing the age about the station yesterday. There was great shouting and firing of guns throughout the evening in token of victory over the board. Strickland. 15th December, 1881. Really the main enemy of Aboriginal people at that time was the Protection Board. It wasn't the missionaries and it wasn't primarily 
the greedy farmers who wanted their land. It was the protection board that um, instituted rations that forced them into starvation and made their lives so desperate. It was the protection board that kept trying to remove people from the stations and the missions in, in order to take their land and redistribute it to white farmers and thereby leave them landless and, you know, vulnerable to starvation. In 1886, the Aboriginal Protection Board comes up with a final solution. It will not only save them money, but it will make the first Australians disappear, allowing Corrindirk and other reserve lands to be sold off. All lawful means should be adopted to raise the half-castes to independence and to merge into the general population. Brother Hagenauer. In an unholy alliance, Brother Hagenauer is now employed by the Protection Board. He drafts a new law, which becomes known as the Half-Caste Act. It states that any of the first Australians who have any white ancestry and are under the age of 34 are now considered not Aboriginal and are therefore exiled from any mission or reserve. Only the so-called full bloods can remain. They take the drastic step of saying that anybody who's got a part bit of European in them is not a real Aborigine and has to leave the reserves. Doesn't matter that their mum is on the reserve. It doesn't matter that their sisters are on the reserve from who come from a previous marriage of their mothers. It doesn't matter that their grandparents are there. They've got to leave. They can't be Aboriginal anymore. It is the beginning of the end, which in the course of a few years will leave only a few pure blacks under the care of Government Board of Protection for Aborigines. Captain Page. They had genocidal intentions. And the assumption was that the older members who were still living on the reserve uh, would eventually sort of die out. And the end result would mean be that the indigenous race would become absorbed into the mainstream population. The Half Caste Act neatly halves the population and conveniently the budget of the Aboriginal Protection Board. The exiles are forced to enter a white community who don't want them. A lot of Aboriginal people disappeared into the general community. Uh, they were um, either white enough or polite enough to um, pass as white people. They would not refer to themselves as Aboriginal people. They would drill their kids into never admitting to being black um, or um, more often not even tell the kids that they had an Aboriginal heritage. So a lot of people thrown off the Missions Act drifted into the general population and were never heard of again. Premier Berry and Anne Bonn both agree that this policy is progressive. Barack and his people now have no one to turn to. To the editor of the Argus, we beg you to put a little column in your valuable paper, please. We have heard that there are going to be very strict rules on the station and those rules will be too much for us. We wish to ask the manager of the station, did we steal anything out of the colony or murdered anyone? Or are we prisoners or convicts? We should think that we are all free as any white man of the colony. William Barrack and the men of Corrindirk. It just brings tears to your eyes because of the frustration of the people trying to do everything they could to accommodate the colonial power and then being deceived. And I haven't got the guts of those people, you know, I, I couldn't do it. Barack makes a final appeal to the Premier. He walks to Melbourne once more. Barack is lame 
He has made the journey many times with other men, but they are all dead. You know, Barak has got the feeling in his heart of all these people who have supported him. Yes, go and talk to the governor, go and talk to the queen. But in his mind, as he walked down there, he would have been thinking, no, I'm going there to beg. And that would have been tragic. We should be free like the white population. There is only a few blacks left now remaining in Victoria. We are all dying away. And we blacks of Aboriginal blood wish to have our freedom for all our lifetime. There is only 27 Aborigines on the station corridor, including men and women. Why does the board seek more stronger authorities over us Aborigines? Barak. His pleas are ignored. The Premier does, however, act on the issue of Corrindirk. He gazettes the land as a permanent reservation. After nine years of protest, their land is safe and can only be revoked by an act of Parliament. But the children Barak cares for, as their Nurangita, are already being driven from Corrindirk by the Half-Caste Act. It is a bittersweet victory. With the young people banished, the communities lose their spirit. Reserves at Ebenezer, Lake Conda and Rumiak all eventually close. Against their wishes, the first Australians are moved off their traditional lands and are forcibly moved to Lake Tyres. Our grandmothers, brothers, were actually told to leave. So they, they packed up and went and moved down to uh, Lake Tyres in Gippsland. And they didn't like it, uh, upset about it, but there wasn't anything that they could really do about it. Um, and then had to get permission, written permission, authority to come back on to see their mother and father and brothers and sisters. Letters from mothers begin to pour into the board, seeking permission to see their own children. Would you allow me to have my two daughters with me here? Another one of them died and I'd not seen her before she died. And I would like the other two to be with me and comfort me. Please, do not disappoint me for my heart is breaking. Margaret Harrison. Dear sir, I take the pleasure of writing to you, hoping you are in good health. I want to know if you could send me a pass, please because I want to go and see my dear children. And please, will you send it as soon as you can? They are longing for me to come home and see them again. I only want to stay two weeks. Would you be kind enough to let me know if you will send it? I remain your sincere friend, Lydia Briggs. Dear Mrs Briggs, the board decided last Monday in pursuance of the powers under the Act, your children should remain at Corrindirk. It is for their benefit. It is better to leave the children where they are. In case of sickness, I will send for you. Goodbye, your friend, Captain Page. If I were to speculate as to why the history of Corrindirk is not taught in schools or universities in the way that it should be, all I could say is that perhaps this history is so shameful that most Australians could not admit that this is the origins of their, their state and their nation. It's just too shameful. In his last years, Barak puts into imagery the world of his people before the whites came. This is his remembrance of things past. Men wear possum skin coats. Women beat time on their possum skin rugs and leaders use boomerangs as clapsticks. 
there are his people gathering together for ceremony, fighting, hunting, and harvesting the food of the land. Europeans and the aftermath of colonization do not figure in his work. These are memories and dreams of a past world. Barak's legacy is a detailed record of his countrymen before the white people came to his land. works of biography. I think they're the works of an, an old man looking back on his life and reflecting on the life that he lived when he was young and what he saw when he was young that will never be seen again in this world. So they're like survivor's records. He was trying to say, this is our culture. You know, this is what we were. This is the way we were. We are um, intelligent, cultural entities. You don't believe it, but here it is. Look, here's our corroboree. Here are the marks. And it was the, the last act of a man whose soul had been devastated. It was a very sad time for Barak. He became very depressed to the point of where the spirit of life had gone from him and said, when the wattle blooms, that's when I shall leave this land. In 1903, as the wattles bloom in profusion along the creek at Corandirk, Barak passes away and is buried in the Corandirk Cemetery. The wind in the trees, the birds on the wing, the rain as it falls, sad tidings they bring. Barak is gone, is gone. We should be free like the white population, and we blacks of Aboriginal blood wish to have our freedom for all our lifetime. Corandirk is sold in 1948. Barak's people buy it back 50 years later. From a population of just 300, today Aboriginal Victorians have resurrected themselves to a population of 30,000. Recently, I was in uh, down near Warrnambool with some young people who were being instructed into their culture by a, a culture man down there. And um, he'd, this young man had seen the return of the bank pie goose. And on those young chests, I watched as the mag magpie goose design was put on those boys. And I thought, that's the spirit of Barack, because here's, here's the evidence of a, a cultural, sophisticated group of intellectuals uh, responding to the, to the earth. And there it is, painted on those young chests. And I thought, we are not dead. <laughs> 